Good evening. I'm going to wait for a little bit for people to arrive. Um, just stick around for a little bit. We're on the eve of Thanksgiving. I hope everyone's doing well. The um, nature of the topic is important because it basically is a operation which uh, which was led by the Central Intelligence Agency um, in regards to a capture or kill operation of Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda, and it was the at the time the largest CIA-led operation in existence. Uh, in which I'm hoping to uh, describe to you in full as the best I can. So with tonight's discussion, I'm going to be using a lot of uh, reading material, documents and files that are going to help uh, eludicate the information to you. And I'm going to share some of that uh, documentation in the description at the end of the video which you'll be able to read for yourself. It's an important operation and uh, something that many people uh, don't even talk about. I see Ecom is here. Um, and so let's talk about the operation known as Jawbreaker. Um, but before, before we get into the details of the operation, what led to the operation? Well, we have to talk about the events of September 11, 2001, but it was immediately after the events of September 11, 2001, in which the intelligence came in that Osama bin Laden had some level of responsibility for the attacks themselves. Now, the CIA back in 1999 um, constructed a plan uh, which was um, which came after the heels of the 1998 U.S. embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania, which killed 224 people. Uh, Den uh, Tenet had declared war on Al Qaeda in December of 98, uh, just three months after the bombings had taken place, and Tenet had given his newly appointed uh, counterterrorism. Uh, Deputy Kofor Black, the authority to outline a plan uh, of attack against Al Qaeda. So, in the um, in July of 1999, Black had drafted an outline, just basically called the plan, um, which was to locate and destroy Al Qaeda and Bin Laden, and. It had been briefed to the CIA operational level personnel in a meeting and to the NSA, the FBI, and other partners involved. And according to a source close to the CTC, the Counterterrorism Center, the baseline draft went like this, quote, uh, pull it up. Kofor Black and his new bin Laden unit wanted to project into Afghanistan to penetrate bin Laden's sanctuaries. They described their plan as military officers might. They sought to surround Afghanistan with secret covert bases for CIA operations, as many bases as they could arrange. Then they would mount operations from each of the platforms, trying to move inside Afghanistan and as close to bin Laden as they could to recruit agents and to attempt capture operations. Black wanted recruitments, and he wanted to develop commando or power military strike teams made up of officers and men who could blend into the region's Muslim populations, end quote. This outline basically was a combination of intelligence reports 
that were coming in from the uh, Jalalabad office station in Pakistan, as well as intelligence reports from Afghan officials on the ground. And so you had a number of different people that were involved in giving intelligence. This would later come back to haunt the United States because much of the information coming from Afghan warlords who were known to turn on a drop of a dime if the price was right in regards to many detainees that were held at Guantanamo. And at one time, Guantanamo held up to 750 detainees. Many of these people had to be let go because they had no affiliation with Al-Qaeda or the Taliban or any other intelligence groups. Many of these warlords basically took reward money for handing in competing Afghans because they are very vindictive, these people, uh, regarding uh, tribal uh, culture. Um, and so a lot of these people basically had no affiliations. But the damage was already done. A lot of these people were tortured in CIA black sites. And I did a video about this not too long ago. Um, but getting back to the intelligence reports, Black outlined this report, and he basically created or helped to create uh, a new activities division within the CIA. And this was called the uh, Special uh, Activities Division, the SAD. After the events of September 11th, um, about 15, I'd say about 15 days or two weeks after the attacks, the U.S. covertly inserted um, a dozen members of the CIA Special Activities Division and the Counterterrorism Unit into the Panjir Valley, which is north of Kabul. This group was led by Gary Schroen. Now, Gary Schroen, just to uh, give you a slight background on him, Schroen is a, a now retired CIA officer who worked for the agency for 35 years. Um, he worked under the, as the deputy chief of the Near East Division and the director of the operations in 1999, a post he held until 2001. Um, and he had a huge background, including station chief in Kabul. Um, in the late 1980s and worked at CIA headquarters in Langley, controlling Iranian operations. And then later, Shrone became the chief of station in Islamabad from 1996-99 until um, he began deputy chief of the Near East Division up until 2001. So Shrone was tasked with the CIA to conduct the initial operations into the fight against Al-Qaeda in response to the September 11th attacks. Now, the team included mostly deputy, the deputy commander and former Special Forces Captain Phil Riley, who was a former Navy Special Warfare Operator and former Army Paratrooper. Um, and a lot of these guys went by other covert names, synonymous uh, synonyms. One of them was called Todd. The other one was called Dalton Fury. I'll talk about him in a bit. He actually wrote a book, and I had no idea later on that he had passed away from pancreatic cancer about five years ago. Um, and this group, this core group led by Gary Schroen, was uh, codenamed Jawbreaker. And they formed the Northern Afghanistan Liaison Team, and the call sign was called Jawbreaker. And Along with this team was a, a number of different um, special forces groups from the United States and abroad, um, which involved the members of the 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment, or known as Delta Force, um, the CIA's Special Activities Division, uh, which I mentioned before, the 5th Special Forces Group, Airborne Rangers, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, Airborne, um, the Special Boat Service, which is the United Kingdom's Royal Navy, which got these soldiers to the point in Afghanistan, the Secret Intelligence Service, also known as MI6, Intelligence Service of the United Kingdom, and the Commando Special Craft, which is the 
uh, special forces of the German military. And there was other coalition forces, but they were Afghan forces. Um, uh, the Afghan forces were led by a number of different warlords. For example, hizb e wahadid Harzaka, led by Karim Khalil. The Uzbeks were led by General Rashid Datsum. And if that name sounds familiar, he actually, uh, his palace was actually taken over by the Taliban when the United States and the Afghans left the country in the summer of 2021. And he had a lavish compound, huge compound. And the Northern Alliance, which were led by General Mohammed Qasim Fahim, the same Northern Alliance that was once led by Ahmed Shah Massoud, but he was assassinated by Al-Qaeda posing as reporters on September 9th of 2001. Um, and so the CIA and the CIA's counterterrorism unit began calling up a very select group of individuals who had later become part of the largest operation in the agency's history at a time. Um, and so the director, George Tenet, would end up tasking Hank Crumpton to work with the Counterterrorism Center. Now, Crumpton was a long-serving case officer who, at the age of 23, was the youngest trainee in his class. He was considered a brilliant analytical mind as well as a great field officer. He wasn't somebody who was taken from the straight from Langley straight to management. This guy actually worked his way up there. And now, currently, he did a interview with 60 Minutes where now he's in charge of, um, uh, I want to say, psychological warfare or something like that. I just did a video, no less, about the operations of how covert intelligence uh, agencies like the CIA conduct um, psychological operations or known as PSYOPs or psychological warfare using the mass media. And I did a separate video on that in which you could view at your pleasure. It got a lot of views, uh, you know, which I'm very surprised anyway. And so this group created by Crumpton, um, he wanted to bring forth a, a militant type of atmosphere to the CTC involving Jawbreaker. And so Shron was having a problem with the Afghan warlords. Now, the Afghan warlords, just to uh, give you an example of how um, insular and very competitive and distrustful they are of outsiders, these Afghan warlords, you know, they, since the time of their birth to the times of their middle ages up to their 40s and 50s, they're very distrustful of outsiders. They don't trust Arabs. They didn't like Arabs fighting in the Soviet invasion of the Afghan war. Afghans are notoriously much more um, uh, capable in terms of fighting within their own regiments. They don't like, and that's why they never accepted Arabs within their ranks. Very few did. People like um, Abdul Rasul Sayaf and Juladin Haqqani and if that name sounds familiar, you probably are familiar with the militant group in Pakistan called the Haqqani Network, which was uh, derived from him, in which they invited Arabs to join their ranks. And their ranks swell, because after a time, the Soviets would actually liquidate so many Afghans that the Arabs were being were, were replacing the dead Afghans, nationals, uh, in the fight. And basically... I think Arabs made up about 10% of the fighting force during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Very small group. And of course, I did a live video about Osama bin Laden and the formation of Al-Qaeda, which came from a training camp in Afghanistan called Al-Masada. Go take a look at that to get an understanding of, about that. Anyway, the Afghans were notoriously flip-flopping each time whenever an NGO organization or whether the U.S. military basically paid them to help them to locate al-Qaeda or the Taliban in the valleys like Panjir or in Kabul or even in the remote areas, Majir al-Sharif, 
are and to um, the very southern parts of the country. And in the northern parts of the country, it's very mountainous. And the fighting that's involved when you have like a Taliban at an elevated position and you have these American, even though they're special forces fighters, they're just not uh, trained or capable of fighting at such a level. And there was an interview done by um, uh, a, a nickname called Dalton Fury. And he basically wrote a book called Capture or Kill Bin Laden, which was an excellent book, by the way, um, in which he says that the mountainous region in the White Mountains, right, which was uh, basically north of the country, which separated Afghanistan from Pakistan, and said that Al-Qaeda and Taliban were situated there, and the Americans were coming from a, a lower position. So they're fighting uphill against an elevated enemy. And anybody will tell you it's such a, a hard position. But the Afghans, the Taliban, were used to it, and so were the Arabs. So they had an advantage there. Okay, so the, the Afghans that were aiding the Special Activities Division, the CIA, into the mountainous regions by Gary Schroen were having a hard time. And this was basically uh, a culture shock. Um, the CIA didn't have many Arab linguists, so they were relying on Afghans to basically translate what the tribal leaders were saying to the CIA and the special forces. And sometimes the messages weren't really authentic in their translations. And sometimes they just got the translations wrong. Pashto is a very hard language. Um, Farsi is another hard language. And there's basically a disconnect. Shron was having a problem. And the problem came from not only that, translations, communication, but also a lot of these Afghan tribal leaders were sympathetic to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and if the money was right, they basically would fight, but not all the way. And we're going to see this in the second half of the jawbreaker operation, in which you'll get a better understanding of how this operation could have been successful, but it wasn't. And so what happened was, was that Trone was basically at a standstill, not making too much progress. Um, and so just days after Schroen leading the operation, two weeks, uh, basically on September 28, 2001, the British, uh, led by his foreign secretary, Jack Straw, approved the deployment of MI6 officers to aid the Americans in the, in the battle, which was called the Battle of Tora Bora. And they were utilizing people involved with the Mujahideen as far back as 1980s. So the British basically were very good allies to the Americans up until this point. And they had language skills, which was such a huge um, component in helping the CIA Special Activities Division in, the, in this fight. But at the end of the month, a handful of MI6 officers with a budget of, say, I don't know, seven to $10 million, uh, which were basically... Most, most of that money was going to to persuade these Afghan tribal leaders to help them in the fight against the Al-Qaeda and Taliban were basically, you know, getting rich. So a lot of these tribal leaders were really becoming millionaires because the CIA was giving them money. And so where was this money coming from? Now, what? Now that's the debate, whether you want to say it came from the State Department through the drug trade. I don't know. And that's not uh, really alluded in the books I've read and the two books I've read on the subject, which is called Jawbreaker, led by, which was written by Gary Bernstein and um, Capture or Kill Bin Laden, read, uh, which was co-authored by the name Dalton Fury. That's not his real name, but that's the name he went by. And I guess they didn't ask questions about where the money was coming from. Okay. Um, so Sean complained to Hank Crumpton, who is the commanding operator or commanding officer uh, in charge of Jawbreaker, in which he was tasked by Kofor Black of the Counterterrorism Unit to
to head the operation. Kofor Back basically told Hank Crumpton, you're to just do one thing, capture or kill bin Laden. I want his head in a box. That's what he said. And even Gary Schroen, who is a you know, longtime officer, almost 40 years, basically said that sounded juvenile, you know, because Kofor Black was basically management. And the problem was, was that these guys on the field, people like Gary Schroen, Hank Crumpton, uh, Gary Bernstein, or a Billy Waugh, legendary field officer, you know, these guys were like legends, basically, in the agency. But they had a disconnect between management. Or they have a nickname called the third floor. I believe it's third floor or seventh floor. Third floor. So the management were basically people who were taken out of Langley who basically wanted to work in an office. And those guys were ass kissers. And so they went straight to the top. The field officers were much more proud. They didn't give a crap about brown nosing. And so they had like a disconnect with management and the cave officers. So when George Tenet became the director of the CIA in the late 1990s, he wanted to refurbish the CIA because up until that point, the CIA had a, a black eye in the public eye. Um, after the church committee hearings in 1977, when they gave their final report about, you know, the assassination attempts in Central America, Iran-Contra later on, a huge black eye in the CIA. You know, they went right underground. And when Tenet, Tenet wanted to show that the CIA could be trusted to the public eye, and he wanted more. He's a very proud man. But the CIA officers basically didn't trust Tennant or Kofa Black and didn't like management. And Tennant basically, I think it was according to Gary Bernstein in the Jawbreaker book, he forced retirement and fired over 200 field officers. And a lot of them were replaced later on by case management officers or management. And so a lot of these people didn't have the prerequisite skills to ascertain field operations, covert operations. And that's what's missing even today, because 20 years later, a lot of those people that were initially hired by tenant are still there today. And so Schroen complained to Tennant, I mean, complained to Hank Crumpton about not getting really anywhere with the jawbreaker team or making any advances toward Al Qaeda and the Taliban, even though that the United States military up to this point was using aerial bombings to destroy a lot of these caves and a lot of the Taliban outposts um, north of the country. The southern Afghans basically were taking over southern Afghanistan in quick time. The Afghans were basically um, fighting on the ground while the U.S. military was bombing, aerial bombing, day and night. And that basically decimated a lot of the Taliban. And the Taliban had a lot of people, thousands of people. Um. The initial airstrikes were happening on October 7th of 2001. And they were airstrikes that were happening in the the country's capital, which is Kabul. And that the Northern Alliance and that the other Afghan tribal leaders, basically after an aerial bombing, would come in. And some of them were on horseback. So, you know, just like in the, the fifth century, when you had, you know, this large contingent of Arabs, the Persians that basically were coming in, just like in, you know, the movie 300. So you had this Afghan leader like General Dotson, who's like a man's man, this guy, you know, with a sword in one hand. And that's no exaggeration. This is what he used to do. He used to go on a battlefield on a horse leading the charge with a sword in his hand. You know, he's got like 200, 300 people behind him with machine guns, swords, and whatever. And they're charging in on the dazed and confused and, you know, bedraggled <laughs> tribal uh, a a Taliban. And they had no idea what hit them because they would come in and slaughter the whole populace. Or if they surrendered, 
they basically, you know, would, if the price is right, they basically would give them money or whatever they had. And they basically let them live and let them escape. And they would just join in the fight anyway. So you had that problem as well. Uh, so there was a lot of problems. So Gary, so what Hank Crump did, did was basically uh, replace Gary Schroen because he was coming on retirement anyway with somebody named Gary Bernstein. Now, Gary Bernstein, um, a little bit of his background, um, he served as a director of operations uh, between 1982 to 2005. Um, he served as CIA station of chief on three occasions. Um, and he was involved with the counterterrorism unit involved in the uh, investigation of the U.S. Embassy bombings, as well as the 9-11 attacks. He was also involved with the Special Activities Division. And in 2000, he was, dis he was actually awarded the Distinguished Intelligence Medal and the Intelligence Star. Um, he actually was born in Long Island, uh, New York. So if he comes in a room, uh, he's a native New Yorker. Um, but he had a lot of experience. And he actually was uh, a good selection. Bernstein was a no-nonsense guy, um, a little bit younger than Schroen. Um, he also had a lot of experience in the Middle East. Schroen did as well, but Bernstein, I guess, got along better. And because of his no-nonsense approach, he didn't really um, take no for an answer, um, if I could say that lightly. And so Hank Crumpton uh, told Schroen about the replacement, and Schroen was actually delighted to hear it. He wanted to get out of there. Um, and as Bernstein landed at Islamabad Airport, he was taken to see Gary Schroen, who informed him about the current operations at hand. Um, and, Schroen, and, and Schroen filled them in on the teams he would work alongside, as well as the Afghan teams that were working alongside, which would produce intelligence on enemy positions and capabilities that the, CIA, the CTC headquarters would use to drive and coordinate the war while working alongside with the head of the U.S. Central Command, General Tommy Franks. General Tommy Franks, who is the commander of the U.S. Uh, military in with the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. As soon as he took over the Operation Bernstein on October 19, 2001, got 200 U.S. Army Rangers from the 75th Regiment, and they helped capture a key area 75 miles south of Kandahar, which was an airstrip. And it was a huge victory. Um, they destroyed a Taliban contingent there. And Crumpton told Bernstein that he led the operations and that having the Deputy of Director of Intelligence of the CIA, John McLaughlin, in charge of operations with Tommy Franks and Vice Admiral Albert Kellan, who is the Special Operations Command of SOCOM. So these were the three big men in charge. Tommy Franks, Vice Admiral Albert Kelland, and John McLaughlin um, in charge of operations at the CIA. Bernstein would begin supplying the Tajiks in the north, and which would help fight against the Taliban in the Panjir Valley. Thing about the Tajiks was they wanted to take credit for the capture of Kabul. However, the CIA disagreed with this and said that it was Datsum who was to go into Kabul and negotiate with the remaining Afghans there about drafting a constitution for the country and eliminating the Taliban. So what was left of the Afghan government, they would deal with General Datsum and the Tajiks were basically jealous up to this point. Um, what Washington, the government officials in the White House, Washington and the Pentagon wanted 
was a pincer attack on the Taliban, which were hiding in caves and ditches. Um, and they were, in, I think the number was in the tens of thousands. Um, with the Northern Alliance coming from the South and the East, and the Eastern Alliance, which was led by a special operations, uh, U.S. Uh, special forces operations by Lieutenant uh, Haas to the east. And so what would happen was because Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in the north, they were going to do a pincer operation, which was really um, a daring operation because they had to go upwards to the mountains. And as high as you get to the mountains, um, it's harder to breathe. But it was the only way because if they came in from the bottom, they're sitting ducks. And there's a valley at the bottom. Panjir Valley. And so it's really hard because they'll just get gunned down. So the, the, the plan was when the Northern Alliance and Jawbreaker teams had defeated the Taliban, the Northern Alliance would stop five miles outside of Kabul and allow Datsum and the, and the United Nations to come and organize a peaceful transition of power which would be handled to Hamid Karzai. And Karzai, if you're familiar with that name, he previously served as the deputy foreign uh, minister as in the Islamic State of Afghanistan, while also being the head of the Poplazi tribe, uh, which was a, a Pashtun tribe. Um, he also visited the Western embassies, including uh, the U.S. embassy in Islamabad several times, talking with um, Norbert Hall uh, and attempted to uh, gain American support for the modern educated Afghans, uh, which were to weaken the Taliban's views. The Taliban basically wanted to create a caliphate in the country and dissuade women from learning from the work sector, um, teach the Quran, uh, their version of the Quran and the Sunnah, even though their views were extreme, they were a little bit different than, say, the views of Al-Qaeda. They're from the views of the Hanafi school of thought. Al-Qaeda is from the Wahhabi school of thought. And I don't have enough time to explain that uh, difference to you, but um, I've done videos about this, and you could watch videos about that. Um, and so one of the jawbreaker units was led by an, a person, but he went by the name RJ and he led the special forces team 595. Now you'll notice that there's a lot of different small, like um, special forces teams, which would have different capabilities, military signals, intelligence, human intelligence, tracking um, so many different um, um skill sets were involved with these teams. And so it, it just was a brilliant military operation, this jawbreaker operation. Um, I, I really recommend the book. I'll, I'll even link it in the description at the bottom. So this jawbreaker unit, which would radio in airstrikes in the Taliban locations in the town of Masir al-Sharif, while General Dotson would charge against the Taliban fighters afterwards. Um, and so the U.S. military in the aerial division would use U.S. B-52 bombers. And they would bomb day and night. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't tell you dozens and dozens of airstrikes and basically bombarded the mountainous region of Afghanistan, uh, the north of the country. It just was a literal carpet bomb. And the al-Qaeda and Taliban fighters were decimated. It really just destroyed them. Um, so what happened was on November 10th of 2001 the Tajiks took control of the city and freed the Uzbeks who were under Taliban captivity and they tried to force the Uzbeks to fight with them a lot of them wouldn't and so they basically started slaughtering them the Tajiks freed them and the Uzbeks actually fought alongside the Tajiks to fight against the Taliban um, so the Tal I don't know what the Taliban were thinking in trying to force the issue with the Uzbeks. Um, but with the recent defeat by the Taliban fighters, 
they the Taliban then headed east toward Kanduz. But RJ and the special forces team of 595 went north to meet them and engage them in battle ahead of time. So with Mazir Ir Sharif under the control of Datsum, there's a place called the Friendship Bridge, which was now open between Afghanistan and the country of Uzbekistan. And it was such a huge, huge win for the Afghans because now the Uzbeks could freely travel in the country and join in on the fight. And it would, it would provide uh, just valuable logistical support in the operation. And so now Central Command, led by Tommy Franks, could now focus its, ass, its air power on the city of Talukran, which is the capital of the Takar province northeast of Afghanistan. Another another um, one of the jawbreaker teams was led by a person named Breen, um, who was in this in the town of Talukran. Breen, um, which had a special forces team called 585, not 595. This was also headed by a master sergeant named John Boldock. Now, John Boldock was relentless um, as he he was really dependent on airstrikes and he would use not the B-52 bombers, but instead he used the powerful um, airstrikes from the Spectre C-130s, which are these big, heavily armed, long endurance aircraft. Um, and they had an array of anti-ground oriented weapons, which are uh, integrated with like sophisticated sensors, navigation and fire control. These huge planes came in and just like dived down the, the mountainous regions and Oh, it created like this great atmosphere. Um, and there's very few videos, but there is a one video by Associated Press which shows these planes just quite huge. I mean, man, if I was a Taliban, I'm like, man, we have no shot, right? And so um, John Bolduck, the master sergeant and part of the 585 unit, called in these airstrikes and Taliban was the Taliban had no, they, they won the, the town of Taliban in no in short order. Meanwhile, over at the Shamali Plains, Lieutenant Colonel Haas, who I talked about before, uh, was waiting on orders to begin making advancements. And Bernstein was known as a calculating individual. And so he was patient. So he told Haas to hold on operations while the Spectre 130s, and then you have the B-52 bombers in the east, Spectre 130s in the northeast, basically bombing the crap out of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, who had no shot at repressing the fighters of the U.S. military, and then the Afghans coming in, cleaning up afterwards. Jawbreaker reports that were coming in had collected information that Osama bin Laden was seen leaving the Nagarhar province and heading toward Jalalabad. This was coming specifically from Afghan reports, not U.S. Special Forces reports. So Crumpton basically was in constant, constant contact. He wanted daily reports coming from Bernstein, and Bernstein was basically with one phone to his ear to Crumpton. Crumpton had his boss, Kofor Black, and he had his boss, George Tennant. And who is George Tenet boss? I guess George Bush. CIA really doesn't have a boss. In in theory, anyway. So that's for another discussion. So Crumpton gave the order to Bernstein to begin forward advancements. And so that gave the green light to Scott Haas. I mean, Lieutenant Colonel Haas. Um, and so the Taliban, basically at this point, were basically hunkered down in Masir Air Sharif. It was basically like a last stand for the Taliban. And there was a number of like approximately 5,000 fighters that would try and defend the forces of the U.S. military, Special Forces Division, the CIA Special Activities Division, and the forces led by Datsum and Mohammed Daoud in the West and Beriyala Khan in the East as the U.S. airstrikes rained down from above. But the Taliban knew that they could not stand the daily assaults because the C-130 bombers, as well as the blue, um, 
want to say blue 30, blue 82. Now, I just have to say blue 82 bombers had a special weapon. And these were used uh, to, to completely, because Afghanistan north in the north was a mountainous region. And so there's a lot of trees, huge trees, you know, 50, 60 you know, feet tall, some to 150 feet tall. And this gave like cover to the Taliban. And so they would hunker down, create these forts, basically shoot from the north. So these blue 82 bombers would come in and they used what they called as daisy cutter bombs. And for those who don't know, daisy cutter bombs, they what they did was they basically scorched the ground, right? So just picture, how can I use this? Picture the Vietnam, right? In remember that movie Apocalypse Now in the beginning when they show these, you know, planes going over, and then in the, the, the first scene, all you see is like this field, you know, this grassy area of, of Vietnam, and then it goes up in flames as a plane goes by. That's what this that's what the Daisy bo cutter bomb does. So basically they're coming in with these blue blue 82s coming in and flattening the ground. All the tree, everything is scorched earth. <laughs> everything. And so Dotson comes in afterwards. The there's still fire in the ground. They don't care. They're coming right in, just destroying you know the the depleted Taliban forces. And it wasn't long before they just like completely surrendered. The Taliban basically surrendered Mazir al Sharif. A huge, huge win. Now, you know, they basically had, it was all over. So now the final stage was to capture or kill bin Laden. The Taliban basically defeated. Omar, uh, Mohammed Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban, basically, you know, escapes. The remaining Taliban surrender. Incidentally enough, uh, Muhammad Mullah Omar, I think, died in 2000 and I want to say 12. You know, I'll look that up just to just to be sure, because I found it. Uh, uh, he died in 2013, and basically, where he died was basically, I think, it was 30 miles or just close to a military base. In other words, he. You know, if you want to, if you want to have a great hideout, live next to the enemy. <laughs> they're, they're looking elsewhere. Or you wouldn't live next to us. You'd be stupid. But yeah, he died in a small like home uh, where he basically went out, never went out and stuff. Which I, you know, that's funny when you think about it. He died in 2013. So now the idea was to trap Bin Laden and his fighters in what they call a kill box. So. It would be three promontories manned by U.S. Special Forces teams. Two new teams would be positioned to the south and the west, one on the Tonga Mountains, another closer to Sangala Hill further south, and the original post near a place called Milgawa, uh, which would be reestablished to the east. Now, U.S. CENTCOM under Tommy Franks, uh, in which Bernstein uh, call for aerial bombardment of the White Mountains. Now, the White Mountains basically is a huge snowy region in Afghanistan. Um, basically, uh, it is the separation between Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan. It's a large mountainous range in South Asia, um, south of the Hindu Kush which is, you know, basically a huge area uh, which leads into the provinces. Uh, it ranges eastern Afghanistan, and it's called the White Mountains because they're the highest points of Afghanistan, and it's always, you know, it's constantly freezing up there. And so al-Qaeda and the Taliban basically were retreating to a place called Spingar, Spin, S-P-I-N, G-H-A-R. Um, and so that's what it was. Just, it's nicknamed the White Mountains. And so you have these B-52s, B-1s, which were basically coming off the carrier ships in the Persian Gulf, which were saturating the mountainside with heavy artillery by fire by day and using, like I said before, the Spectre 130s at night. So Al-Qaeda were hiding in the caves to avoid being reduced to 
molecules at this point. Um, Bernstein, what he wanted to do by doing this was he wanted to flush bin Laden out so that they could use aerial planes to use heat-seeking capabilities. This would be the AC-130 ships that had the capabilities of using radar, heat-seeking radar. And if there was a large contingent of heat coming from the ground, they basically were assuming that this was where Al-Qaeda was hunkering down in. And so that they could just bomb the area and that would be the end of the war. Um, so he knew that there was only one way out for bin Laden. And what he wanted to do was basically push bin Laden to the wall of the White Mountains, so to speak, anagorically speaking. And then you had this like box. Here's the mountains. Here's the box of special forces that were surrounding the east, the west, and the southeast using the special activities division of the CIA, the U.S. special forces of 595, 585 units, all skilled at um, using human intelligence that were coming from the Afghan fighters. And what, and this was a huge mistake, by the way, Tommy Franks, who was acting on orders by the White House, wanted the Afghans to lead the charge. Now, look, it was no secret from the CIA, even to Gary Bernstein, even to Gary Schroen, like I said before, that the Afghans could not be trusted. They just couldn't. But Franks was adamant in not losing American lives regarding bin Laden and al-Qaeda because he theorized that we lost enough Americans in September 11, 2001. I don't know. So Bernstein actually called General Tommy Franks and said, listen, we want 250 U.S. Special Forces groups to block the northern escape route. It would be a special group, a special unit that would basically counter, they would be flown to the north and then block the escape route into Pakistan. Franks, remember, he's head of CENTCOM, basically told Gary to use the Afghans to block the back of Pakistan. Now, Bernstein was livid at this command. Could We couldn't be trusting this. So he basically called Hank Crumpton, thinking that, you know, in a fruitless attempt to persuade the U.S. military, you know, head of operations in Afghanistan, CENTCOM, Tommy Franks, to somehow pressure him, in which he had no power to do so, to get 250 special forces. That's all they needed, basically. And this would have been the end. It would have been the end of the war on terror. This is it. Because according to Dalton Fury, who is one of the special units involved with the fight of against al-Qaeda in Bin Laden, he even admits in the 60 Minutes interview that he himself was basically just 2,000 kilometers from um, Bin Laden, which is basically 1,000, what, 500 meters, 1,500 meters from uh Bin Laden, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. One, I'm sorry. One thousand miles. One thousand miles from Bin Laden. He was that close. Meanwhile, Al Qaeda, who is basically also in Kandahar, a small unit, about. Uh, 260 miles north of Kandahar, in the town of Gardez, one of Al-Qaeda's military commanders, and this is important, this was a huge loss for them, um, but a fellow by the name of Muhammad Atef. Now, I, I know you've heard him mention that, you've heard him that I mentioned him before. He had a, he had a previous name called Abu Hafs al-Masri from the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. He later renamed himself Muhammad Atef. He became the military commander of Al-Qaeda, when its original military commander, Abu Obeda al-Bansharri, died. 
in a ferry accident, he drowned in British Columbia or in a um, a river in British Columbia. And so Mohammed Atif became the military commander and he was a very shrewd individual. Bin Laden really respected him. And he was a primary reason for the training of Al Qaeda in the mid nineties when they transferred, when they became a terrorist group. Um, it was Mohammed Atif that basically uh, trained them in the arts of guerrilla warfare, bomb making and whatnot. And um, he was killed by an airstrike. It was considered a huge win for the Americans at that time because nobody killed a higher up in Al Qaeda. And yeah, later on, we captured some recruiters like Abu Zubaydah and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed um, and um, uh, Ramzi bin al-Sheib, a financier, you know, low level. Yeah, we captured some of these people, but nobody is high up we ever killed or captured. So yeah, it was a huge deal to kill this guy. And so what they did was when they looked through the remnants of the bombing of uh, Mohammed Atif's hideout, um, while they were digging through the rubble of Mohammed Atif's house, um, during a search of the rubble, they found important documents such as training manuals, uh, which I basically... Um, posted on my um, WordPress. So the Al-Qaeda training manual is basically for public view. If you want to look at that, go to my WordPress and type in, you know, Al-Qaeda training manual and you'll see it. And it's a huge manual. It shows you the brilliance of this guy's mind on guerrilla warfare. Um, so now December is coming. The real winters are coming. So now it's becoming like really brutal cold because you know a lot of people think Afghanistan is basically hot it's humid climate in the winters especially in the mountainous region brutal cold brutal really cold so now bin Laden is left with uh, I want to say approximately 500 al-Qaeda fighters maybe a little bit less and they were hiding out in the locals with their homes and caves and whatnot and so these when I'm talking about locals I'm talking about like these small makeshift huts uh, made out of primitive brick, uh, mud, and whatnot. And so it's like really comfortable in these houses. But, you know, they didn't have basic necessities like Americans would, like a TV or radio. And so what happened was um, in one of the Taliban's, uh, uh, when they, in the Mazir al-Sharif, I, I, I forgot about this, really important. So I, I basically forgot to tell you when the Americans and the Afghans took over Mazir al-Sharif, they found a radio belonging to an Al-Qaeda fighter. Now, this radio, I'm sorry, it was recovered from a former Taliban safe house in which one of the Taliban commanders had. And it was a safe house. Amazingly, it, it survived under the aerial bombing. And it was a radio which had been used to listen to to the radio transmissions of Al Qaeda. Because the Taliban were, you know, they had to keep in co contact with Al Qaeda. So they were using these radios. So they found one of these radios. And during the days and nights, they would listen to Al Qaeda fighters in the White Mountains. One night, bin Laden is heard on the radio. Because one of the military commanders with Gary Bernstein while he was staying in one of these um, built-in uh, Afghan houses, which was a makeshift, you know, operations center, they heard bin Laden on radio because the Afghans could, they know his voice. So Bernstein and, you know, whoever was he with, I don't know who he's with, but they basically surrounded like, oh, me, this is it. And he basically, they heard him apologizing to Al-Qaeda fighters because they're surrounded. And I'll quote you from the book, Jawbreaker, in which I'll read from the book what he was telling them. And let me pull it up. Quote, I'm sorry for getting you involved in a battle. If you no longer can resist, you may surrender with my blessing. And of course, it's not English, it's Arabic, but that's the translation. So here he was. And even according to Dalton Fury, he basically said that he, you know, he had this neck on his, he said, he's going to, he's going to, we're going to capture him. 
And according to him, he was just basically a thousand miles away which was nothing compared to an aerial plane, you know, getting there and whatnot. And so it was amazing that they could capture him or, you know, but they basically wanted to kill him. Um, that was the, the operations plan initially. However, and this is the real kicker. Uh, this will be the kicker of the whole uh, live discussion. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not going to give you my opinion on this because I want to read the direct quote from the book, Jawbreaker, which I'll put in the description box. If you haven't read that book, please read it. It is a great book. It's in my top 10 favorite books I've ever read. And I'm dying to interview that guy, Gary Bernstein. Um, Because I heard he does interviews, but he's very hard to get. Okay, quote from the book. Quote, the Special Operations Command history records that CENTCOM refused to back the ceasefire coming from the Afghans. Let me back up a little bit. The Afghans negotiated a ceasefire with al-Qaeda because I think, basically it's in the book, al-Qaeda gave them money. And so Afghans committed a ceasefire. And when the U.S. Special Forces went to advance, the Afghans turned their guns on them. And so there was a standstill. Quote, the Special Operations Command history records that CENTCOM refused to back the ceasefire, suspecting a ruse. But it said the Special Ops Forces agreed reluctantly to an overnight pause in the bombing to avoid killing the surrendering al-Qaeda fighters. Gon Sharak, an Afghan warlord, negotiated by radio with representatives of al-Qaeda. He initially told Dalton Fury that a large number of Algerians wanted to surrender. A large contingent of Algerians were al-Qaeda fighters. Then he said that he could turn over the entire al-Qaeda leadership. The entire. That's bin Laden. I'm in Al-Zawir. Fury's suspicions increased at such a bold promise. By the morning of December 12th, no Al-Qaeda fighters had appeared, and the Delta Force commander concluded that the whole episode was a hoax. Intelligence estimates are that as many as 800 Al-Qaeda fighters escaped. But bin Laden stuck it out. Despite the unreliability of his Afghan allies, Fury refused to give up. He plotted ways to use his 40 Delta Force soldiers and a handful of other special op troops under his command to go after bin Laden on their own against 800 fighters. One of the plans was to go at bin Laden from the one direction he would never anticipate, the sub, the, the, the northern side of the mountains. We wanted to come in the back door. Fury explained later, pointing on a map to the side of the Tora Bora enclave faking, facing Pakistan. So in other words, they would attack from the south, but they would have to travel north. The peaks there rose to 14,000 feet, and the valleys and precipitous mountain passes were already deep in snow, feet high. The original plan that we sent up through our higher headquarters, White House, Delta Force wants to come in over the mountains with oxygen, tanks. Coming from the Pakistan side over the mountains, and come in and get a drop on Bin Laden from behind. Because, now, end quote. This was basically Bernstein's idea. Because Bernstein had complained to Hank Crumpton, like I told you before, about getting 250 Special Forces fighters to come from the, from the top of the mountains and come down south, effectively blocking the pass. Dalton Fury, completely outnumbered with this small contingent of groups, didn't care. He was going to use 40 of his guys against... When, according to the book, 800 Al-Qaeda fighters. He probably wouldn't have been successful if he did it. And it was basically almost a suicide plot. But he said that I was so close enough that I could have, you know, we could have probably seen him and maybe got to him. I'm going to read you the rest of the quote because this is huge important. Huge important. This is coming from the same book. Quote, 
the audacious assault was nixed somewhere up the chain of command. Undeterred, Fury suggested dropping hundreds of landmines along the passes leading to Pakistan to block bin Laden's escape. Ingenious idea, right? So the according to Fury, the first guy blows his leg off, everyone stops. That allows aircraft like the C-130 Spectre to, over, to overhead and find them using the heat-seeking uh, technology. And when they see all these heat sources out there, they see this is the large group of Al-Qaeda moving south, they can bomb them and kill all of them. Now, that's an ingenious plan when you think about it. That proposal was rejected. About the same time, Fury was desperately concocting scenarios for going after bin Laden and kept getting rejected by the chain of command. Why? End quote. Why? Because U.S. CENTCOM, Tommy Franks, was well into planning for the next war, the invasion of Iraq. This is going to be really important coming up in just a minute because I'm going to tell you why bin Laden escapes and why it's important. Now, Tommy Franks, of course, like I said before, is taking orders from the White House. Bin Laden escapes right from the joys of victory. He Now, it's reported from news reports over the years that he split his group in two. So according to the Jawbreaker book, 135 of the men headed east and into Pakistan, and over 200 others, including Bin Laden, left for the Pashtun tribal areas of the Panchinar, guided by members of the Ghazali tribe, which is a local Pashtun people sympathetic to Al-Qaeda and the Arabs. And so you had the rest of Al-Qaeda just staying in Afghanistan. Now, I'm also going to read you from a report uh, which is entitled, and I'll, I'll, I'll link this important document in the description. It's entitled, The Last Good Chance, a reassessment of U.S. operations at Tora Bora, written by Peter John Paul Krauss, Security Studies Program at uh, MIT. And the report says this. Since all we would agree that we should have done is based in large part on what we could have done, it stands to reason an examination of the latter, which would have a significant impact on the determination of the former while serving as a valuable piece of campaign assessment in its own right. This essay addresses the feasibility and consequences of carrying out the major critique of inserting significant number of U.S. troops to engage al-Qaeda, such as the Tora Bora in late fall of 2001. The mission to capture or kill bin Laden and the al-Qaeda troops required a large-scale block and sweep operations in which U.S. forces, led by the Afghans, would have had to move against the enemy while simultaneously preventing their escape by blocking potential exit routes out of the region. The ability to complete such a complex mission required adequate intelligence, force, size, and skill, logistical support. Interestingly enough, the United States attempted to carry out a block and sweep operation at high altitudes three months after Bin Laden's escape at Tor Bora in the Shiakat Valley to the south. And that operation was called Operation Anaconda. I'll talk about that in a bit. Now, I also want to go back to another part of the book. All of this, which I'm going to read in the book, is going to come into one huge bombshell at the end. And you'll understand why the cover-up of 9-11 and the Iraq war continued. It'll make sense. Gary Bernstein wrote the following quote. Bernstein, now this is before bin Laden escapes. Days before bin Laden escapes, he's surrounded. Bernstein's leading the charge. I'll quote for the book. Quote. I'm talking with Hank. I clear. He clears his throat. I took a deep breath. 
it felt as though someone had just thrown a bucket of cold waters in my face. We selected a permanent, this is Hank, we selected a permanent chief involving Jawbreaker, which would allow you to return to your post in South America, which is far away from the fight in Afghanistan. Bernstein, I took a deep breath. I couldn't believe it. What were we doing? I'm minutes away from winning. The most important battle of the war. I ask, who's the new chief? The room turned silent as everyone, all led by the Special Activities Division, led by the Special Forces Division, all the leaders, couldn't believe what they were hearing. The answer, it's Rich, the chief of the blank. And I'll tell you who that is. The blank is easily decipherable if you, you know, did a little bit of background on it. The person who's replacing Gary Bernstein is Richard Blee. Richard Blee, who headed the de- he was the deputy chief of Alex Station, the Bin Laden issue station, which basically withheld pertinent information about Al-Qaeda to the FBI and the State Department, about two hijackers, two Al-Qaeda operatives inside the United States for 16 months, which later turned out to be hijackers for Flight 77, which crashed into the Pentagon. This is who's replacing Gary Bernstein. Bernstein, when will he arrive? Crumpton, he should get to you by the 14th of December. Bernstein, I'll meet him at Bagram on arrival. End quote. Now, everybody there basically said, no disrespect to Rich, but we, we, but you have been the only reason why, the main reason why we've gotten this far and why Al-Qaeda and Taliban are surrounded, basically decimated, in which Gary Schroen couldn't have done. Bernstein created a miracle in short time. And they're going to replace him with Richard Blee. And I'll tell you why they did it. Bin Laden escapes. Bernstein comes back to the United States. Richard Blee takes over. Bin Laden escapes. Richard Blee brings an associate with him to act as uh, an assistant toward the jawbreaker team. <laughs> Who does he bring? Michelle and Casey. And if that name doesn't sound familiar, she was the head of the Yemen Al Qaeda Yemen hub ticket, in which she told the FBI, Mark Rossini, and Doug Miller that they're not allowed to share information regarding Khalid al Midar and Wafa Hasbi's U.S. visa with the FBI. Now, according to Bernstein, he says that the um, when they when Richard Blee took over Jawbreaker, uh, they basically were there to not head Jawbreaker. But basically, knowing that Bin Laden had escaped, that Tommy Franks wouldn't give the okay to block the only escape route into Pakistan was basically because well, let me give you the excuse that Tommy Franks gave. Tommy Franks would be quoted by the New York Times in October of 2004, and I'll read you the direct quote. Quote, We don't know to this day whether Bin Laden was at Tora Bora in 2001. <laughs> Some intelligence sources said he was. Others indicated he was in Pakistan at this time. Tora Bora was teaming with Taliban and Al-Qaeda operatives, but Mr. Bin Laden was never within our grasp. Really? However, one of the special forces operators, Dalton Fury, said this, quote, rather than allowing Bin Laden to escape, Franks and Donna Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, could have deployed a measly 250 American troops in Afghanistan already or 
near the border with Pakistan to block the exits while simultaneously ending the war. The complex mission would have been risky, but analysis shows that it was well within the reach and capability of the American military. End quote. Now, let me give you the bombshell. Tommy Franks, head of the CENTCOM, taking orders from the White House, basically was getting reports that the neocons in the White House, led by Richard Pearl, Douglas Fight, Paul Wolfowitz, were already planning the next war, Iraq, because they needed to show that Iraq and Al-Qaeda were involved in the 9-11 attacks. This is, came from an earlier foreign policy outline called the Project for New American Century and under the Paul Wolfowitz Doctrine. Okay? I did a whole video on this. Now, for years prior, they wanted to invade Iraq. And so here was a chance to invade Iraq. However, if bin Laden is killed, there is no reason to invade Iraq because it would make no sense to invade Iraq if Al-Qaeda is defeated. Now, what I'm employing to you is speculation, sure. But doesn't that sound really sketchy when they basically could have just deployed 200 Special Forces fighters to block the only exit into Pakistan from bin Laden and Al-Qaeda? They were already surrounded by the U.S. Special Forces Divisions and the Special Activities Division of the CIA and Afghan forces. We're talking thousands of people here. Plus the aerial bombardments. I mean, they were totally destroyed. I mean, because of this um, operation, Jawbreaker, they decimated the Taliban. The Taliban were defeated, destroyed. Few remaining fighters. Al-Qaeda was decimated. They could have destroyed everyone altogether, but they weren't authorized to do so. Now, as for Richard Blee and Michelle Ann Casey, according to Gary Bernstein, they weren't there to do necessary operational work with the jawbreaker teams. They were there to escape the congressional inquiries from testifying at the 9-11 Commission and the Joint House Inquiry. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because then they had to explain why the CIA withheld information about al-Qaeda operatives living inside the United States from the FBI and State Department. Because Richard Blee was head, he was the deputy chief of Alex Station, and Michelle Ann Casey, who worked at Alex Station, was basically the head of the Yemen intelligence hub in which they were collecting human and signals intelligence regarding the comings and in and outs of the Yemen hub. Who gave them the authorization to do that? Was it Tenet, Director Tenet of the CIA? Was it from the White House? Had to be either or. Someone's guilty here. And there ain't no clean hands. And with bin Laden escaping into Pakistan, the threat of Al Qaeda survived another 10 years because on May 1st, 2011, he's assassinated. Because at that point, what does it matter? Al-Qaeda basically is no longer a threat. So now they could kill the threat. And instead of capturing him, which would have been a reasonable thing to do, and bringing him back like they did with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi Yusuf in the 1983 World Trade Center bombing, Ramzi bin al-Sheib, Abu Zubaydah, Mustafa Hasnawi, Abdul Aziz al-Ali, these guys were all in Guantanamo, allegedly having participated in the 9-11 attacks and operating it. You couldn't catch a six foot five guy with a limp and bring him back to the United States as the ultimate trophy and bring him into the Southern District of New York to face charges? Or were they afraid of what he would have to say? I think it's the latter. Ecom, didn't General Myers, right after the state publicly, write this state publicly that getting bin Laden was never the goal. That came out later. Bush said that too. Remember, Bush Bush did uh, a number of uh, media briefs in which he later, he went on to say, I think it was a, the White House briefing 
room where he basically said, yeah, we'll get them. We'll get them. And this was this was during the initial stages of Afghan, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, where Bush, Bush basically devolved. He basically says, yeah, we'll, we'll get bin Laden. He's hiding. And then later on, it's not important to get bin Laden at this point. And later on, would he even admit to the media that bin Laden's not even important? We have bigger fish to fry. And that was Iraq. So you can understand how Tommy Franks could have been maybe pressured by the State Department at the highest levels of government to say, no, don't kill bin Laden yet. We need to invade Iraq on the premise that it was Iraq that gave Al Qaeda chemical and biological weapons, which all later turned out to be false. All that information that came from torture from even Sheikh Al Libby, who told his torturers from the CIA and a CIA in Egyptian uh, CIA black site, he told them whatever they wanted to hear. Also, false intelligence from Israeli intelligence about a meeting in Prague with Mohammed Atta and Iraqi officials about chemical weapons, that turned out to be just fictitious, made up, never existed. So they needed a reason for bin Laden to live and to enter a war in Iraq. That Iraq was responsible for 9-11 because they were affiliated with Al-Qaeda. And who, who spread that message? Who helped to spread that message? Paul Wolfowitz. And of course, Lori Milroy. And for those who don't know, Lori Milroy, I think I'm saying her last name wrong, she wrote the book Study of Revenge. And she even tried desperately. She wrote an article, um, which was the national interest, uh, in which she enti it's entitled um, The World Trade Center Bombing, who is Ramsey Yusuf and why it matters, in which she even tried then to tie Iraq to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. So in other words, you know, this is a regular neocon. And of course, you know, uh, former CIA director James Woolsey called the book, uh, you know, brilliant. And of course, it was promoted by none other than Paul Wolfowitz and Douglas Fife, you know, the, the worst neocons on the planet. Um, so yeah, so she basically tried to desperately show that there was Iraqi connections going all the way to night, to world change bombing into 9 11, and all this was fictitious, all this was made up. Does she get in trouble for this? No, not at all. In fact, her book was promoted by the neocon cabinet into pressuring the Bush administration to fight against the Iraqis. Um, huge operation. So that's the nature of the jawbreaker operation. And um, it was important because it showed that there could have been a huge, very most likely a, a tremendous conspiracy involving the Iraq war and not allowing two prominent CIA case officers to testify at the 9-11 Commission or to join House Inquiry or to escape having to explain why they withheld information about al-Qaeda operatives inside the United States from the FBI and the State Department. And they never gave their explanations as to why, and they never will, because nobody knows who they are and nobody's talking about them. Yeah, I blame the 9-11 truth movement because they're still stuck on the idea that there may not have been planes involved. That's why they're an utter failure. Because this should be given priority. This. Because we can name names. We could show there was a conspiracy to withhold information. And we could show the people who withheld the information. You would think that this would be important enough to talk about on most 9-11 circles. But you won't hear it. Jason Burbis won't talk about it. Christopher Bowen doesn't know anything about it. Rebecca Roth won't talk about it. Alex Jones or Jim Fetzer. But that's who are given the attention. And you wonder why, whether it's manufactured or not, whether it's intentional, it could be. I just think it's general ignorance. 
Now, I'm not saying that I should be at the forefront of this. I'd rather not. I like talking to a very select group of people. But I would hope that more people would become educated on matters like this. It is important. And it shows a mountainous cover-up involving the State Department and even the head of the U.S. Central Command Operations, Tommy Franks. Why wouldn't you use U.S. Special Forces to capture or kill bin Laden and the rest of al-Qaeda? Why wouldn't you destroy them using blue 82 bombers or C-130 bombers and basically destroy the whole lot of them? Because bin Laden and al-Qaeda can still be used as a will-of-the-wisp type character where you won't see them, but they're always the threat. They're out there. We got to invade this country because Al Qaeda is still out there. And that's what they did in Iraq. And that's why the Iraq war was authorized uh, or allowed to be conducted uh, through the testimony, the flawed testimony of U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell at the United Nations Security Council in 2003. Sitting right behind him. The CIA director, George Tenet. <laughs> and it was through the CIA, which gave false intelligence from the torture of Sheikh Ibn al-Libi, that precipitated the Iraq war. But instead of firing or holding George Tenet accountable, he was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom by George Bush himself. The hypocrisy knows no bounds. And so, unless you have additional questions, I can probably end the stream right here, right now. Um, eight people are in the chat. Not many questions, not many people. Maybe the early hour, I tried to do this stream at 10 o'clock thinking that um, it would be accommodating to the people, but it seems that the later I do the streams, the more people I get. Strange. I think the last stream I did was at, what, 1130, 12 o'clock? And people showed up, like 20 people. <laughs> so only eight today. But then again, it's the holiday week. And so, um, you know, people have things to do other than watch me. Who cares? Right? But if you don't have any questions, I can end the stream now. And um, I guess I will see you at the next stream. Thank you for coming.